Friends, I hope you can, uh, as you start to uh, get logged in, um, my name's Dale Rounds. I'm the Associate Dean for Continuing Education at Princeton Seminary. And my co-host today is my colleague, Sushama Austin Connor. She's our Program Administrator for Continuing Education and the Center for Black Church Studies. Um, and our tech support here is Jacob Davis. He's a master's in Christian education and formation here at Princeton Seminary. He's graduating this May. Um, and I'm going to briefly introduce our four panelists, which is why you have signed on today on, at your lunch hour or if you're further west of us sometime in the morning. Um, Dr. Eric Barreto um, is the seminary's Frederick and Margaret L. Weyerhauser Associate Professor of New Testament and a Baptist minister. Sonia Waters is with us. Sonia is um, assistant professor of pastoral theology at Princeton Seminary and an Episcopal priest. And Dr. Heath Carter is Princeton Seminary's associate professor of American Christianity. And Brian Rainey, is Brian with us yet? He was on earlier and I think I may have lost Brian. So we're hoping Brian is gonna make it back in with us shortly. Uh, Brian is Assistant Professor of Old Testament here at Princeton Seminary. Folks, we're glad you are here with us. Um, we're doing um, this second of two panels. Last week we gathered um, a few pastors together for some conversation, and today we've gathered four of our faculty who've been very willing to say yes to this on top of everything else that they've been doing. Um, I keep hearing this and I keep saying it, that we're in unprecedented times um, and uh, our faculty, much like you have been doing with your congregations, trying to discern how to continue um, to teach and preach and worship with and provide care for your congregation at a time when you cannot be together um, and at a time that is particularly stressful for um, Many, our own faculty that at Princeton, you all know, we're very much a residential um, school. And so our classes take place face-to-face, -face, just like y'all are used to worshiping face-to-face. -face. And in a matter of about two weeks, um, the whole institution has shifted to online learning and it's been a Herculean effort. Um, and I think it's going quite well. So um, I'm grateful that these four have agreed um, to be with us in this way again today. Um, and there's Brian. Hey, Brian. Hi. So um, I'm going to just start and ask um, each of our panelists if you would just, um, I'll start maybe with um, Sonia. Sonia, if you would just, you know, how, how are you doing at this point? How are things going for you? Uh, yeah, it's hard. It's 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 a, it's a hard season uh, to be in, and uh, I do want to to say I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm I'm in a parish right now, um, working as well, and so uh, um, I just want everybody to know that it's just amazing the work that you do. You are so important. You are so important, and and uh, doing things like this is actually actually helps, right? Uh, uh, an ability to give back, an ability to connect. We all need that right now, and so. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I am surviving, um, as we all are, as best we can. Um, and it's really a time to think for me about, and I'll talk about this later, about, about surrender to God, about my own faith life, um, and how I'm going to get through one day at a time, um, uh, trusting in God and doing the best I can. And I think we're all in that boat together. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here today. Thank, thanks, Sonia. Um, Eric, how about you? How are you doing? I think I'll start where, uh, where Sonia started to, I think is um, a lot of gratitude in these moments, gratitude for people leading in these, again, unprecedented times, trying to figure out what worship looks like in these spaces, how we maintain community. Um, so a lot of gratitude in those moments. At the same time, I also have been feeling that it's, it's a day-to-day -day operation about how well I'm doing. I follow The Rock on Instagram and The Rock said that He's like 50-50, some days are great and some days he feels deflated. And if The Rock feels that way, then I think it's okay for the rest of us to, to kind of be this 50-50 space. So um, you know, day by day, I think one of the things I've been learning about faith in this moment, and I've taught my students, but now I'm experiencing it in a different way, is that part of what community faith does in community is to hold each other. So in moments when you can't quite hold faith in that same way you did before, that others can hold that for you, 
and then we get to do that for others as well. Uh, and I'm feeling that in a very particular way, um, the way that we have to lean into one another just uh, to make it through these weird days. Um, so, but grateful that you all are here. Thanks, Eric. Um, Brian, how about how are you doing? Um, I'm I'm doing okay, uh, and and um, the transition to online teaching, it, I'm a little out of my element. Um, I'd say that um, most of us are used to in-person teaching, and it it's taking some getting used to. Um, at the same time, I, I want to um, to uh, just go back to something that Eric said about gratitude and the fact that you know we are able to um, transition, and I would say relatively smoothly. It's it's what we have to get used to is the is the change, um, but I think um, that there's been a lot of good leadership at uh, PTS in particular. Um, I like the fact that that PTS, for example, um, you know, called this pretty early and saw where this was going uh, pretty early. It wasn't behind um, and playing catch up like a lot of, a lot of other places uh, have been doing. So that was some wisdom that I'm also very grateful for um, in in all of this. Um, and the fact that we are still teaching and that we have um, and that we do, um, and, and there are a lot of people who are insecure about um, work and those kinds of things. Um, and, and so that, that I'm really thinking about that uh, as well um, as, as, we, um, as, we, as we deal with this. Thanks, Brian. How about you, Heath? Yeah, I mean, I think I would I would echo a lot of what my my colleagues have shared. I mean, uh, first of all, great to great to be with you all uh, today. Um, you know, I think as a as a people person, I'm I'm struggling to feel like the the digital interaction is is uh, you know not quite the same um, mm -hmm. as just the kind of daily um, literally kind of rubbing elbows with people in in the cafeteria and in on the streets and and whatnot i miss all of that interaction and i know many many others do too um, but as as others have, have noted i mean just in awe of of medical workers and their families and so many other people who are sacrificing so much right now um and who are whose work is essential to the functioning of our society and who are putting themselves in at risk in order to to do their their work, um, so many who are struggling right now. So I mean, I, I think um, you know, taking heart too in, in the ways that you can see people coming together, even as we have to remain physically apart. Um, so uh, you know, it's it's a I think like Dr. Vreda said, it's it's a day to day, and and some days are better than others, but overall, I'm really grateful for for so many. Great, thanks, Heath. Folks, the way we've set this up is we have um, one, one question specific to each of our professors, and I'll go through each one of those and let each one of them address that question. And then when that's done, we'll have a general time of, of Q&A, and you can pose your questions to us in the um, Q&A panel there. Um, you can, if it's easier for you to stick it into the chat, you can do that too. Um, we've got three of us trying to keep our eye um, on those. It's, it's best though if you send uh, your questions to all panelists because I'm not expecting um, Brian, Heath, Sonia, and Eric to also be watching the, the chat at the same time. Does that make sense? So, um, so here we go. Um, um, Brian, is it okay if I start with you? Um, and I'm wondering, you, know, you mentioned your gratitude for what is strong leadership so far at this time. And so a question we have, have for you as an Old Testament scholar is um, what stories um, or characters or models of leadership in the Old Testament might pastors today draw from um, in leading communities, communities of faith um, in these kind of uncertain times? Thank you. Um, one of the, the, the things I've been thinking about over the last few weeks is uh, Joshua 1. Um, I'm just going to put it out there. Joshua is a very difficult book theologically. Um, it has 
um, genocide in it, uh, just to put it frankly. Um, so we're going to have to uh, deal with that um, and, and put that aside for a moment. Um, but I think, you know, the, the thing about interpretation is that we interpret a text um, for our own time and for our own context. And so um, I'm going to just bracket that and put it aside uh, for a moment and we'll deal with that another time. And I think about the first chapter of Joshua, because this verse, Joshua 1, 9, has been going around um, on memes and on the Internet about uh, uh, the, it's very famous uh, where God commands Joshua to be strong and courageous. Um, it's don't fear, don't be afraid for the Lord your God is with you. Uh, and I'm not a fan of fear not Bible passages, simply because I'm aware that so many Christians struggle with anxiety and fear and um and those kinds and ptsd and um issues that aren't just going to go away by reciting biblical passages about being strong and being you know, not being afraid i mean people are going to be afraid and there's actually and, and i hate to be realistic about it but there's a lot to be afraid of i think um with this thing um so i think it's, it's not fair um, to just throw Bible verses like this at people, say, you know, be strong, be courageous. Um, you know, there are people who are quite worried right now. Um, what I noticed about that passage, though, is that there are two kinds of elements of Joshua's courage in that passage. The first is, if you go a couple verses earlier, um, I think it's 1-7, um, Joshua is told to be strong and courageous uh, according to uh, the Torah, um, and according to the entirety of the Torah. And then if you go down to the end of the chapter, um, the community um, is actually helping Joshua in being courageous. So it's like the community claims at least, we find out later they're, they're kind of fickle, but the community claims at least to have his back um, insofar as he is being uh, bold and courageous. I want to talk about uh, the Torah aspect for a minute. Um, you know, the Torah in, in that particular text, Joshua is a Deuteronomistic text, so it means follow the law perfectly. Um, but I think as Christians, we can understand Torah in the way that, um, say, um, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself as the entire law. Or, uh, you know, Jesus would say that the Good Samaritan, you know, his behavior is the entire law. So be strong and courageous insofar as you are loving your neighbor as yourself, right? And that is, is part of it. And then at the end with the communal aspect, um, I think um, it, it means that it, it, there is a social responsibility uh, embedded in that command to be um, bold and courageous. Um, so it's not an individual admonition. It's a call to a community um, to be bold and courageous and to also be people who we others can turn to to help them be bold and courageous. I don't really like the translation of the Pagini way. I, I, I prefer things like resilient rather than bold and courageous. Um, and I think we have the right to understand it that way. And passages that say, don't be afraid, one of the Hebrew words there is um, katat, which means um, literally to be broken to pieces. Um, and so the way I'm understanding that is the passage is saying, be resilient and don't fall to pieces in this situation. Um, and, and do what you need to do to hold yourself together. So it's, to me, it's a command for self-care, not necessarily a, um, a, an admonition, admonition against emotions. So that, that I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's great. Thank you, Brian. Um, folks, if you have follow-up questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and we'll return, return to that. Um, Sonia? Um, I'm going to have a very broad question for you because I just feel like pastoral care is, I could have about a thousand questions at this point, at this point right? 
So as both a priest in the Episcopal Church and a scholar, you've devoted your work to pastoral care. What word do you have for pastors at this time? Uh, I think um, it's hard to talk to pastors because I know you're already so so skilled and doing so much. And um, all I can do is affirm uh, really what you are already know, you know, what you're already doing. But I think I think if I could say anything, I had lots to say, but the first thing that came to my mind is to emphasize uh, we can do nothing about what is happening. We can do nothing about what is happening. And I'm emphasizing that. Um, uh, not because we can't do a lot, right? We, we, we connect, we sustain, we ground, we lead, uh, we help in this time. Um, but I want to encourage you to watch um, the helplessness that you feel uh, and the uh, frustration you might have about your limits at this time. Uh, clergy burnout comes uh, not from how much you work, but how emotionally you do your work. Right? So the expectations are what burns us out. Um, so our job right now is to act faithfully um, in a time when we have no control over outcomes. So acting faithfully and trusting in God, and, and that is hard to do. I am not taking uh, that uh, lightly or saying that easily. Um, uh, when people are in crisis, we do. We try to regain control and assert agency. Uh, that's part of crisis. And this is good until you can't, until you can't really hold everything together. Um, as my colleague just mentioned, um, how are you breaking apart, holding together as best you can? Uh, so, so this is a real time to do what we can and to do some reflection in our own lives about the sovereignty of God um, in our lives uh, and, and our own faith lives of, of acting through our principles, through our values, through our calling, doing all that we can to connect and to help, um, but also know uh, that there's a lot here out of our control, right? So I just, I just wanted to begin with that. Um, uh, and then I want to, to suggest this is uh, unlike most crises we face in ministry, right? So we know what to do in crisis. Uh, we offer practical and spiritual support. Uh, we offer meaning making uh, in, in the midst of things that seem meaningless. Uh, um, and we also uh, engage in acts of repair, right? So that's a return to mastery, a return to agency. Acts of repair can be anything from uh, gathering in worship, um, uh, acting in protest, um, uh, helping each other, right? Acts of uh, uh, agency and mastery, praying. Uh, recommitting our lives to God, lamenting, all of these things are, are acts of repair, right? But this is unlike most crises we face in ministry. Uh, first, it has no clear time limit or resolution. So we can't say it will end here or it has happened, or now we can grieve over it, it's continual. There's also no visible threat, but there's a constant threat. So we can't uh, see the virus or know how we will get it. And this means that our bodies and minds are constantly anticipating threat. And what this does for us physiologically is it sets our stress system on overdrive. Um, and so we're in a chronic stress situation and that for us and for our people will bump up into crisis as we get overwhelmed by our situations. Uh, the hardest thing is that usually Christians respond to all kinds of crises by gathering, right? That's what we know how to do. We gather, uh, whether it's practical services or love or protest or prayer or worship, we gather, right? Um, in, in God's good design, this is also the best thing that we can do to support our parasympathetic nervous system, to calm our stress down, um, and also to engage our attachment systems. Uh, all the things that we do with our bodies, singing, movement, ritual, touch, belonging, attachment, all help calm our stress. So this challenge, as you well know, um, is how to do things without our bodies right now, right? Theologically, bodies matter. And we're, we, are, we are seeing that more than ever um, as we cannot bring our bodies together. Um, but this means the work that you do is vital. Uh, whether you're doing Zoom calls or you're, or you're presenting your body out there in, um, in, in videos that you're sending to your people, if you're calling and you're being as verbally present as possible, um, affirmations, grounding, um, telling people how important they are, how they're thought about, how they're loved, all of these uh, gestures that seem sort of helpless and, and not enough to us are actually vital. 
they're vital. So your work right now is, is so important, right? Uh, to keep making the connections you're making as many types as possible, uh, to offer emotional grounding in anxiety, right? So, uh, so what we need to do um, uh, very basically as our, uh, as our stress goes up, um, uh, adrenaline, um, epinephrine, uh, cortisol rise in our systems. This cuts off or dampens the work of our prefrontal cortex. And what that means is um, we're, we are not able to think in complicated ways in goal-directed ways, in, uh, we're not able to sequence our, our, our thinking as well as we used to. And this means that as people keep on getting flooded, they're gonna get overwhelmed, right? So we can do a lot of good in coaching people to stay in the present, that day-by-day -day stuff that already my colleagues were talking about, uh, to get out of the spin, um, organize goals, prioritize goals, um, know that God is with you, uh, um, uh, think about just the next right thing to do, not five days, not the future, right? So helping to ground people in their anxiety is something that we can offer in our pastoral care. Um, keep actively reminding people of their identity, their belonging. You are ours. You belong to us. We are together in this. We all love you. We're thinking about you. All the things you're already doing, the, 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 um, the prayer chains, the phone trees, the, uh, the videos, they, they all help with this, this process of connecting people to identity and belonging. Also, your role as spiritual guide. Uh, now is not the time for complex thinking, right? It's time for humble, down to earth, admitting our limits, reminding people of the beliefs that already resonate with them. So in your community, in your particular church, there are things that you say all the time. Um, every church has different ones. Um, uh, whether it's um, um, all will be well, and I know it's, it's shallow, but they've heard it a thousand times, let's say in your church, um, or they've heard you, uh, they've come to Eucharist a thousand times, or they've sung that one hymn a thousand times, right? Bringing people back to what they already know, to the touchstones are more important right now, the things that already resonate deeply with them, the scriptures they're familiar with, um, simple information clearly and often given, uh, and grace for emotional reactivity. And people are gonna get emotionally reactive. It's okay, it's, 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 not, it's not them, it's their limbic systems. And that's all right, right? So to be able to tell people, it's not because you lack faith, it's not because you lack willpower, it's not because you're going crazy. You got a lot of adrenaline running in your system uh, and that is a part of your stress system, a part of the chronic stress you're under. So let's think about how you can exercise, meditate, pray, uh, how you can reach out to another person, uh, how you can um, uh, donate to a food bank right now, how you can do something to gain some mastery. Uh, so all of these little things that you're already doing um, um, are profoundly uh, important for your people. Um, I think that's, I could keep on talking. So we can, we, we can gather again and talk, but, but <laughs> But maybe I should stop there and, and, and come back uh, uh, later for, for, for some more stuff. But this, what you're doing already is great. Keep those connections going. It, it may feel like you're, you're, you're talking um, into nothing. You are not. The more you connect, the better right now. Right. Thank you, Sonia. That's great. Um, Heath, um, this has come up in some other conversations I've had um, with some pastors. Just wondering... Um, you know, what, are there any particular episodes in the church's history, um, you know, where it has faced challenges like this? Um, mm. any, any historical insight that might be illuminating for pastors right now? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the things in times of crisis and also just on an everyday basis uh, that I find can be consoling about church history is this uh, fact that um, there's some comfort in, in precedence that, that, you know, what we are experiencing today in some ways, it's historic, it's, it's um, maybe unprecedented for us, but that the church and, and humans have faced challenges like this one in the past. Um, and, and I think there's actually some comfort um, just in that, in that fact. I think, you know, it's, it's hard to, to narrow down in some ways to a particular um, moment that, 
that captures all or, or that would, would kind of um, get at all the complexities of what we're facing now. So I thought I'd offer a couple of, of different thoughts. I mean, one is that, I mean, certainly in every major national, international crisis um, from wars to pandemics, um, you can find all sorts of evidence in history and church history of churches engaged in humanitarian work and um, and beyond, you know, even just meeting the, the material needs of people, also lifting up the, the promises of a God who is with us in times of struggle. Um, that was certainly true here in the U.S. during the 1830s cholera epidemic, during the Civil War, during the 1918 flu pandemic, during the First and Second World Wars. So many examples um, of, of kind of ordinary heroism in terms of both meeting people's material and, and spiritual needs. Um, I think one of the things that um, struck me as I was kind of reflecting on, on this question is um, I think we know that crises like this don't hit everyone the same and, and um, they can exacerbate um, inequality, they can exacerbate and, and further marginalize those who already face struggles in our midst. And I think at their best, um, the churches have been attuned to the ways that that the that crises like the one we're facing right now can can um, make people's lives some people's lives exceptionally even more difficult. Um, and I think I think to the extent that um, there are gentle ways to help people that you're in community with see this, um, it could it could be wonderful. Um, I think oftentimes in the past, those who were before the crisis in you know close proximity to people um, on the margins, they were often really proactive in, in coming to, alongside those folks. So I don't know if you saw, there was a wonderful piece in the New York Times last month that was telling the story of these 2000 Catholic nuns in Philadelphia who during the 1918 flu pandemic um, threw themselves kind of sacrificially into the fight to care for the sick and the dying, uh, many of whom in Philly in 1918 were poor immigrants, communities of color, um, remarkable to read and to be encouraged by the, that kind of witness. Um, one thing that, uh, another sort of example of this, uh, churches kind of being especially attuned to the, the different ways that crisis can hit different communities um, that comes to mind for me is uh, the stories around Japanese internment during World War II um, you know, the Quakers were really out in front speaking about the problems of internment, but a lot of mainline Protestants actually ended up joining them in criticizing that policy, were really um, engaged in demanding care for the material and spiritual needs of those in the internment camps and arguing for their rights, um, both during and after the war. Um, and that activism and that involvement in, in people's um, particular needs the particular needs of Japanese Americans during that crisis um, had beneficial effects for decades to follow. Historians have told the story of how people who were um, kind of engaged in that work around internment um, would go on to become engaged in other fights for civil and human rights long after the Second World War. So I think that's sort of an encouraging thing to think about what may yet come from this that might be good, um, even as we deal on an everyday basis with deep struggle. Um, the other thing that, and I think this may actually kind of fit too with some of Dr. Waters' comments um, that comes to mind, I hope it provides a sense of, of relief, um, is that I think in times of crisis like the one that we're facing right now, um, churches have also been able at their best to come to grips with the fact that they can't do everything. Um, during the Great Depression, a lot of, of white Southerners were initially really resistant to state and federal relief programs, but as the crisis grew worse and the churches kind of reached the limits of their ability to meet people's material needs, many pastors and congregations alike became newly open to accepting help from others. Um, and they, they, you know, continue to do what they could to contribute to people's material and spiritual flourishing, but they also realized that they didn't have to do it all. Um, and in that sense, the crisis actually helped to cut through some of the ideological lines that tend to structure our, our conversations in and outside of church in uh, kind of the routine aspects of, of, of life. Um, so I hope, I hope uh, some of that is encouraging. Certainly happy to think more with all of you about precedents and, and ways that we can be encouraged and find hope 
and history uh, during this time. And, and again, just grateful to you for gathering with us today. Thanks, Heath. Um, and, and Eric, what, um, what New Testament stories um, might pastors draw upon for enrichment and guidance right now? What comes first to your mind? Um, um, I just want to return to something that I said earlier is that mm -hmm. the note of gratitude. And one of the best things about my job is I get to learn alongside my colleagues. So just hearing you all rehearse your expertise has been really fabulous. So grateful for all of you. Um, when I think about what scripture can do at this moment, I think it's important for us to, to think about what scripture can't do. So it's not going to give us an easy set of steps for emerging from this crisis. Um, it's not um, an easy handbook for how to deal with the financial crisis, crises we might be facing in our churches, the personal crises people are facing, the relational crises. The Bible doesn't function that way. It's not this easy handbook for us. But what I've found in my work and I think in, in my students' work is that where the Bible works really powerfully for us is as a source for imagination. And going back to some of what Dr. Waters is saying, I feel the limitations of my imagination in this moment. I think uh, the worry, the anxiety, the, the rush every time you see breaking news, and that I think is interfering with our abilities to, to think imaginatively. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of loss. I think we're seeing a lot of pain. We're seeing a lot of death. And the question is, how can we not naively pretend that stuff isn't happening, but allow scripture to be an imaginative spark for us that lets us in the midst of all the realities, all the realia in front of us, to then also wonder how God is moving in these spaces, how the resurrection power is still in our midst, how God's salvation is still infiltrating a world mm -hmm. so full of death and loss uh, and worry. So one place I've been turning to, and, and like I said, I, I think I, I hang out in the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles a lot, but there's one verse at the beginning of the book of Acts that has been kind of sticking with me during this moment, and that's actually just half a verse. It's uh, the first part of Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, so Luke writes, while staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. And here I'm drawing a lot on the work of my friend Matt Skinner. Uh, in his great book, Intrusive God, Disruptive Gospel. And what he helped me see about this text is that before the calls of the ends of the earth and before the fireworks of Pentecost, and before the prison breaks, and before everything else that happens in the books, book of Acts, before all the doing, before all the acting, before all the miracles that are performed, before all that, Jesus calls the disciples to do something that when Jesus calls me to do feels really impossible, and that's, that's to wait that harder than going to the ends of the earth is to wait, to wait for the dawning of God, to wait for the dawning of the spirit. And that's been feeling particularly meaningful and difficult in this, in this particular moment when we're not quite sure what tomorrow looks like. We definitely don't know what next week looks like, let alone a couple of months from now. In this moment of waiting, I think a couple of things are happening. One, is that I think this moment of waiting is apocalyptic in its most literal sense. Uh, so apocalyptic, I think, often brings to mind for us the end of the world and like all these apocalyptic movies. But the term apocalyptic just means, in Greek, just means unveiling. And I think this moment of waiting is making clear uh, the broken structures of our world, making clear that uh, these folks that are, we are now relying as frontline employees, um, I think our economy often sees as disposable. It's people that shouldn't be paid that much, right? So that grocery stockers and grocery workers are now seen as frontline workers. This moment is apocalyptic in that way. It's revealing for us, I think, the character of, of our broken structures. But I think also it's unveiling for us anew the character of God. Uh, the character of a God that draws near to us, not just in moments of triumph, not just in moments when we know what we're doing, but when we don't know what tomorrow holds, God walks with us in that uncertainty. And we, when we feel the scars of the frailty of our bodies, Jesus has experienced that directly and walks with us in that moment. So it's for me on, on, that this waiting is a moment of, of revelation. Uh, I think this waiting can be a place of that can be life-giving, that can give us clarity about what matters. This, um, 
this forced upon us slowing down might bring us back into whatever the next thing is with a new set of perspectives. But I think the story also augurs something else. So in the midst of that waiting isn't just these moments of revelation and these moments of clarity. Um, I think in that moment of waiting, there's also a whole lot of, of pain and, and sorrow that we have to name and acknowledge. So the other thing that happens in the first chapter in Acts, before we get to Pentecost, what happens in the waiting, one of the things that happens in the waiting is that Peter stands up before the community and says that we have to find someone to take Judas's place. That the community has to wrestle with this moment of trauma in their own midst, this moment of betrayal, this moment of someone who's walked with them um, being lost to them. And how do we recover? How do we restitch this community back together? How do we move from this moment? What does forgiveness look like in this moment? So I think it's important in this waiting that we also realize that this waiting can be revelatory, can uh, be conducive to the growing of our faith, but it's going to come at a, at a high cost for many of us, for people who've lost their jobs, uh, for people who are sick, for people who are caring for people who are sick, for people who are worried for people who are sick, right? And we can't draw near them. We can't go with to the hospital to see them. This moment of waiting, I think, is also a moment of sorrow and loss. And it's a sorrow, it's a grief, it's a loss that we don't walk through alone. Um, there's a great little piece in the Harvard Business Review that uh, basically was naming that what we're all feeling right now is grief, but we're having a hard time naming it. Um, and I think Dr. Waters, again, is, is helping us with this. Uh, there's one more piece I'd love to draw your attention to. So the Hispanic Theological Initiative, which is housed here at Princeton Seminary, has a new project called Open Plaza. I'll put the link here in a second once I finish jabbering here. Uh, but there's a piece called uh, Comida de, de, de los Pobres. Uh, and it's about precisely this apocalyptic moment that we're in and what it's revealing about the structures of the world. So I'll put that link up in the chat here uh, in a second. It's a really hard time, I think. It can be a really clarifying time. And I think the work that you all are doing and, and the leading that you're doing and the self-care that you're doing for yourself, this is how we care for ourselves. This is how we care for our communities. And I think right now we're in this moment of waiting. And I think this text might just open up our imaginations about the dimensions of that waiting, what it means for us and what it means for the communities that we serve. Thanks, Eric. Um, so Shama, you're helping watch the Q&A stream for me. And um, you, do you have some questions that we should, should start with? And folks, if you have more questions, please put them there. You're also welcome to just click the raise your hand button um, and then I can unmute you and you're welcome to, to just ask your question and not have to actually chat it or text it. So, all right. Awesome. Um, so why don't I just start from the top? I see someone's raised their hand. So I'll ask one question that was posed to Sonia and then Dale, maybe we could take Lori's mm -hmm. question and then keep going. Mm -hmm. So um, again, my name is Sushama. I uh, work in continuing education with Dale and all these fine folks at Princeton Seminary. And I'm happy to be here. So Sonia, uh, this question is posed for you from Lisa. Lisa is wondering about planning now or in Eastertide when maybe there's a deep breath coming for pastors. She's wondering about planning for the post-trauma experience when we do come back together, what you think about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we're, I think we're going to need to do that. Um, it's going to be interesting how it takes shape, right? Um, we're going to have to wait and see, and it's going to, it's going to change by community, right? So if there are communities where there's a lot of, um, financial crisis and loss um, uh, socially and socioeconomically, that's going to look different from places where uh, people have been relatively uh, stable financially and socially, but maybe have lost loved ones um, or, or have been sick themselves. So it's going to look different depending uh, on the communities uh, that, we, uh, that we have. Uh, what, what's going to be important is, is, of course, to not ignore that a big thing happened. Uh, it, if there is a, a, a particular uh, discrete ending to this big thing, um, uh, but to gather and to um, to have opportunity for people to to talk about what's been going on with them, uh, to to make some uh, to find out in your particular congregation 
where you might be thin in your theological reflection on certain issues, like uh, mortality, fragility, death, um, God's providence. Uh, so each community obviously is strong on, on some theological claims and uh, weaker on others. So where you need to build up the education, uh, uh, how you need to give people opportunity to share their stories with each other. Um, but also, as, as uh, Dr. Carter suggested, um, well, what now? Um, what does this mean about how we are all? We often think our theology is what we know in our heads. Theology is, is implicit to our practices, right? And so this is uh, disrupting our practices. So it's an opportunity for when we can come together uh, to not just deal with emotional trauma, but uh, remember dealing with trauma is not just talking about it. It's, it's, it's regaining mastery and meaning, right? And so then the question is in this time of, of breakage, um, uh, are we going to reflect upon um, our part in the social systems, um, our ways of being um, involved for good um, uh, in our world, uh, how, we, uh, how we see ourselves uh, as connected in ways that we had never imagined that we were, um, socially, economically, um, in our needs to be, to be touched and held personally. Right, so, so in all of these levels, we have an opportunity to enter into some, to, to enter into some storytelling in terms of personal needs, but also reflection in terms of mastery and meaning making and who are we gonna be now, right? So, we, so hopefully we'll have those opportunities um, if, if that's, if, if that's a, a very basic um, answer to your question. Thanks, Sonia. Laurie, um, I, one, I'm gonna- One piece about that. Hop in, hop in. <laughs> and I was wondering if Dr. Waters might say, uh, not to put you on the spot, but I think one of the, I have been um, dreaming of the day when we're all in church one day and imagined, I think for a long time I was holding on to the hope, like there'd be one day and boom, we'd all be back. But now, right, it seems clear that it might be more of a trickle, that it might involve some waiting. Um, yeah. So how do we start thinking about not a moment when things change, but this gradual, yeah. do you know what I mean? I, think, I don't know how to think Absolutely. about that. No, you're, you're right. I mean, and this is a challenge for leaders because as, as, as Eric mentioned, we are all going to be grieving in this process too, right? So this is going to be a challenge for us. But um, as, as we figure out, as we get kind of a feeling for how the situation might be unfolding, um, and then as leaders, we think about how we can um, help people in how that's going to unfold, right? So people will be anxious to connect. Maybe medically fragile people won't be able to connect. Uh, maybe people who have lost their jobs are going to have a lot bigger problems, right? So then how are we going to look at that and start to um, help people uh, uh, understand, as Eric said, that waiting is, is, is part of the process, that maybe you can't be back now, but these people can be back. How can these people then reach out to these people? So it, it might be a process of unfolding that is much more complex than us all suddenly having um, uh, an exciting Easter celebration in the middle of June. Uh, so, so absolutely, yeah. Okay. I have a, I do, before I get to, to Lori's question, we have a question in here that kind of dovetails with, with Eric and Sonia. And the question is to Eric, but Sonia, you might hop in on the, other people might hop in on, the, on this as well. It says, Eric, can you talk more about the grief in the waiting? Um, loved ones that we can't see specifically, what are some stories I can read to understand this with my faith? Yeah, I saw the story and I think I, uh, one story that came to mind was Luke chapter eight. It's, um, it's one that Luke borrows from Mark. It's that, if you remember to intro New Testament, when you talk about Mark and sandwiches, right? So it's like the story about the woman with the issue of blood with uh, the issue uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the girl that's restored to life in between that. And this, I don't know quite what to do with this because I think it's a really good question. I haven't quite wrapped my mind around how I might think about it. That might be one interesting biblical story for thinking about this, right? That Jesus is on his way to this moment and in this moment of healing brings life to this woman with the issue of blood. And in the midst of that, the, the child that he was going to go help also died. Um, but he says, don't worry, do not fear. So this is back to some of the stuff that Brian mm -hmm. was bringing us to. Do not fear, only believe, and she will be saved. Which, uh, you know, thrown in a Hallmark card or in a stitching looks a little naive right now. But in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of that transformative experience, then 
can we imagine that hope not as naive but as hard won a hope that that we get that we acquire that not that we acquire but that we we harness we nurture in the midst of grief not over against it so are there stories that that call us into those moments of grief not as a way not as a way to not grief as a way that takes us away from hope but a grief that informs and shapes and gives root and strength to our hope Great, thanks. Okay, Lori, I'm gonna let you talk and ask your question. Are you there? Lori? Yep, I'm there here. You Can okay, you hear me? Hop in quickly, yep. Okay. Um, hi, Dr. Bretto. hi, Jacob. Um, I just wanted to first say that I think you guys are really stellar and I um, very much appreciate you being here and I just want you all to know that. Um, the other piece is, is that um, I've been studying eschatology for a long time, and I think Dr. Bretto and Jacob both know I, I had a near-death experience, and uh, it significantly altered my life. Um, and I lived right next to where Jonathan Edwards had his great awakening in Bolton, Connecticut. So uh, I have a very different view than most people, and I believe that Luke chapter twenty-one eleven. I believe we're here. I think that uh, in eight years, we are at the 2000 year anniversary of the murder of Jesus. So I think we're here and that's my opinion and everybody has their own, but, but in amongst that fear to me is great joy because I know that that means Jesus is coming and that's a beautiful thing. So I just wanted from your perspective, all of you come from a whole different realm than I do, um, what your thoughts are. I could say a little bit here. I think because part of the context of Acts chapter one is Jesus promise that he's going to return in the same way that he went up. Um, one of the tricky things, of course, is I think I think in a lot of American Christianity, um, that kind of apocalyptic hope that informed Jesus and Paul and informed the early church has been transformed into um, too often a way to kind of fantasize what the end might look like to figure out the order in which things are gonna happen and who's gonna, who's gonna win and who's gonna lose. When the, the eschatology, I think, of the early church is one that's not about us primarily, not about the future primarily, but about God and God's present. So if God's promises are true, then how do we live in light of that reality? If God is gonna transform the world and has started transforming the world already, how do we live now? So what I hope is that if we do think about apocalyptic um, theology and eschatological theology, and when we think about it, we don't turn our gaze toward the future and what might be coming, but instead turn our eyes toward a, a God who says, look to your neighbor and look to their care and their, and their lives to know what the future, what, what my future looks like. So I hope that, that we just turn toward each other, toward our communities in this moment. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a, a New Testament person, not my testament. Uh, but um, I, from what I understand of Luke's gospel, it's, it's really into the realized eschatology that it's about um, the kingdom of God being in one's own midst. Um, and so I would uh, echo uh, Dr. Barreto's words, which are that, yes, it, it's, um, we, I think we'd be better off um, looking at here and now truths because I think that's what's going to be in our face. Um, and, and there is, a, there is a, there is an eschaton, there is, there is eschatology. Um, but um, the here and now truths I think are going to be the things that are, that are, that are really pressing on people's hearts um, and, and what we will have to respond to uh, pastorally. And, and I think that the same is true in, in um, Old Testament uh, passages about if, in fear not and these other kinds of passages. They are, um, many of them are about the here and now um, and about God's presence and, and presence, present presence um, in our lives. Uh, but I do think, however, that um, getting back to the apocalyptic, um, apocalyptic is unveiling. And it is, it, Dealing, we do have to deal with ultimate truths um, and hold that intention with the here and now truth. So I don't want to dismiss uh, the questioners. Uh, I don't want to dismiss the question. 
um, and, and just completely toss out uh, the apocalyptic element of this because there are, but I will say that we're living in that tension of ultimate truths coming into contact with very, very uh, pressing here and now truths. Yeah, I think I would add to that. Um, we don't know the the hour or the time, um, um, but but it is interesting to, to think about how uh, an increased awareness of our mortality um, and an increased awareness of um, the hope, our eschatological hope, um, might change how we feel about this moment um, and how we live through it. Um, that that eschatological hope. Um, uh, when it comes, um, as we as we long for it, um, teaches us how to live differently now, and also teaches us that this is all not in our hands. So, so, so what 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 struck me in, in my in my tradition is that the um, uh, the burial rite is connected to our eschatological hope, um, and so as as we fear our mortality, or we or we fear that the loss of others, um, uh, that that hope. Um, for for the renewal of the world, the renewal of creation, the renewal of our bodies, um, uh, um, God's final justice is part of, of our death liturgy, and 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 for me, we um, what we what we say at our at our burial is, uh, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last He will stand upon the earth, and after my awaking, He will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see and my eyes shall behold who is my friend and not a stranger, right? And so that's the hope um, uh, we carry with us as we take all kinds of perceived risks with our own lives at this point, and as we fear the lives of our friends and loved ones um, and, and, uh, and all those who touch, who touch us. So I just wanted to, that's what I thought of um, at that, at that um, at that eschatological concern. So. Thank you. Um, Margot Walter uh, is saying that she just attended by Zoom a congregant's funeral in which no one but workers were present. Um, what can pastors add to the traditional funeral rite that offers assurance and hope when we are disembodied from one another? I think this is something that more and more we're going to be trying to figure out how to do this. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? This is a hard one. Yeah, this is a hard one. I'm, I, I feel like I should speak, but I don't know. Um, I don't know any more than the 100 people on this chat know, right? Yeah. Um, but I know that I have in the past had to, um, I, I'm a very liturgical tradition, so it's a little bit easier for us to kind of connect in to, to a book, you know, um, and I have in the past had to do uh, commendation on the phone uh, with people. Um, and uh, the one thing that I might encourage is that whatever is most familiar do. Uh, so we tend to want to innovate, um, but in times of crisis and loss, actually it's not innovation that people want. They want the old words as much of the tradition as possible, whatever your tradition is, and everybody has a tradition of the way a liturgy flows, um, the old songs, uh, uh, ways that are th that we can touch down um, in, in, into our hope. Um, so, so that's what 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 I've done via phone. Um, but it's it's not ideal. It's not ideal at all. Um, so uh, other people have done Zoom and found at least to see people's faces was, was powerful. Um, but I'll, I'll let other people who have um, some ideas. I think, uh, I don't have answers. Um, I have just more questions. Um, I think people are, are wondering or reflecting a lot on what, what it means to be community and what does it mean to be human um, and the importance of embodiment. I mean, I, I'm rambling, I'm sorry, but I know that our own chapel office has, is trying to sustain our daily rhythm of chapel um, 
and they've like con each congregation I've sort of been in touch with people are doing it differently some are doing live kind of like what we're doing right now some are doing pre-recorded things but I will say that although it is not at all equal to walking into Miller Chapel and being with the seminary community um, and my Sunday, you know, recorded worship is not the same as walking into my church and being there. There is still something about uh, seeing the familiar face, hearing the familiar voices, say the familiar words, and sing the familiar songs. So it is limited, but I still think there's nurture and care, and it feels to me that God is still present in that. I don't know if y'all can just speak to your own experience of your worship experiences right now, maybe that's one way to kind of get, get at some of these questions. Just how is this working and kind of not working for you? Where is it helpful? Where is it not? Where are you feeling community? Um, and I, I don't know, maybe that's another way to, to, to get at this. I am, um, I would, I, I guess, Part of what I'm thinking about as, as we're grappling with this, which I agree is kind of beyond all of us at some level to say, what can we do to really um, meet the deep grieving and mourning that's happening in many people right now. Um, but I think, I mean, along with what um, both of you were just, was, were just saying um, in terms of the familiar, I think of so many cases in the life of the church and, and believers past who, in moments like this one have tapped into those songs. I think about someone like Fannie Lou Hamer, who in some of the lowest moments of her life, the night, the morning after she was brutally beaten in a Mississippi jail um, for her civil rights activism, um, Fannie Lou Hamer woke up and started singing these um, songs and the other civil rights activists who were imprisoned alongside of her were pulled into that song. They weren't able to, to touch one another. They weren't able to see one another but this suddenly this cell block was full of a song that had been with them and in their hearts all along and that in that moment in that dark um jail uh gave them all strength and brought them together in a way that was also a witness to the people who were um jailing them and so I, I think, you know, so many moments like that where in, in times of crisis, the things that we've, the songs that we've sung, the things that we've said, the scriptures that we've turned to, um, maybe we see them and hear them anew and they resonate in a way that, um, you know, they haven't before and they bring us together even when we can't be physically present to one another. Oh, so that made me think about um, how at the uh, PTSM had this great idea that I think would also be useful for uh, funeral rites and also for anything in uh, any kind of church. And that's the rolling pictures of the peace, uh, the, the idea of um, seeing, seeing people and in those pictures. And so you could imagine that if you were doing a funeral via Zoom or, or via um, some kind of recording, that you could have a rolling memory kind of picture. Everybody could send a memory in, like ways for people to connect and be involved in that way, uh, to send a memory to, for kids to, to draw things and take pictures of them and send them so that they could all be shown at the, in, in the middle of the service to, to connect people in some way. Um, so along with music, also, also images might, might be good. You're muted, uh, Dale. I needed to unmute, thank you. Does anybody have anything else to say before we go? All right, I will send us out um, with the last verses of um, a morning psalm for today, which is Psalm 27. I'll read the concluding verses as our closing prayer together. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Thank you, everyone. Um, and
and we will continue to be holding you in, in prayer. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you.